Berlioz, 22nd of December, 1833. Paganini came to see me. He told me that he had a Stradivarius viola, a marvellous instrument which he wished to play in public, but he lacked the right music. Would I write a piece for him? You are the only one I would trust with such a commission, he said. I replied that I was more than flattered that I could say, but that to live up to his expectations and to write a work that showed off a virtuoso such as he in a suitably brilliant light, one should be able to play the viola, which I cannot. No, no, he said. I insist. You will manage. I can't possibly do it. I am too ill to compose. Paganini's Gran Viola, or Contro Viola, as he sometimes called it, is first mentioned in a letter which he wrote in Paris on the 28th of February 1833. A year later, he reported that he had considerable trouble importing this viola into Britain. He wrote Jeremy, At last I have retrieved the Gran Viola which I had believed had been lost by the London customs officials. I got it back on the 1st of April. On the 28th of April, the Times reported, Last night, Signor Paganini introduced a performance on the viola, which was the first time that he played this instrument in public. The viola that Peter's playing is made by Barrack Norman, who around 1700 is probably the preeminent violin maker in London. It's much, much larger than, uh, than a conventional viola, and one of the particular things is that the ribs are so very deep with these intricate folds just here and here which actually make the instrument very easy to play this despite having the deepest ribs i've ever seen on a viola by the time we get to the uh to, to the end of the viola it's actually one of the thinnest set of ribs there are so this fits beautifully under the chin what this instrument was originally designed for will remain a mystery i think there's nothing in the musical record from London in that period which implicates the use of an instrument like this. Uh, 
a little bit earlier there's Purcell's Fantasias, which this could be useful for. And if we go back about 40 years or so to the orchestra of Jean-Baptiste Lully in Paris, the Cant de Violin, uh, which is a viola kind of instrument sitting between the, mod the viola as we know it and the cello, is an instrument which would certainly have been familiar to players at that time. No surviving examples of that exist, but reconstructions of that come out to something that's remarkably similar to this. Barrack Norman himself is an extremely interesting maker. Uh, the instruments that he made are amongst the finest of the sort of 1700 period. And uh, one sees on Viola da Gamba that he made incredibly intricate marquetry tail pieces and fingerboards and an awful lot of decorations showing incredibly high status. This instrument seems at first to be rather dull and brown, but on the back of it we have his monogram, which is the letters B and N for his initials doubled and put over them. These are quite rare in, uh, in London, but they come from Huguenot silversmiths who came over after the uh, revocation of the Edict of Nantes. And we see those in personal seals, we see them in silverware, and we see them on Barrack Norman's instruments. Barrack Norman has a leading role amongst a group of makers who occupied the area of St. Paul's Churchyard around St. Paul's Alley uh, from the middle of the 1680s until the 1720s. In fact, the community carries on right over, right over till the 19th century, but that's when it finds its heyday. Its heyday is actually the same period that St. Paul's Cathedral is being built, so the building starts in 1688 and doesn't finish until 1714. So at a time when they're actually the most populous area of instrument makers in London and arguably in Europe, beating Paris and Venice even, uh, it's at the side of a big construction work. They're so integrated with St. Paul's Cathedral that we know, for example, that Nicholas Hawksmoor, the assistant architect for the cathedral, owns two vials, I think, by Barrack Norman. And one of the very interesting things about this instrument is that the head is, although it doesn't look unusual for, a, for an instrument maker's carving, actually when we get into the sort of the nitty gritty of how it's carved, it's quite unlike what you'd expect from a violin maker and has an awful lot of the habits which we see in architectural carving. So we can take this, this instrument into St. Paul's and see concordances in the wood carving and the stone carving, whereas we don't see quite such clear concordances in other violins in, in the English tradition. The period up to 1724, which is almost exactly contemporaneous with Stradivari in Cremona, really represents an extraordinary golden period for English making. And uh, with Barrack Norman at the head of that, it's difficult to compare him exactly to Stradivari. A little bit later, so 10 years after Barrack Norman died in 1734, actually Johann Sebastian Bach is credited with creating an instrument called the viola pomposa alongside the Leipzig maker J.C. Hoffmanns. And the surviving example of that, which remains in Leipzig, is rather similar to this as well. So this seems to reflect some kind of pan-European idea, something that we might find in 1660s, 1670s France, something that we might find in 1730s Leipzig, where there's music for it but quite what this was intended for in the 1700s, 1710s in London will remain a mystery. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
When Berlioz came to compose the piece of music for Paganini's viola, he wrote, My intention was to write a series of orchestral scenes in which the solo viola would be involved as a more or less active participant while retaining its own character. By placing it among the poetic memories formed from my wanderings in Italy, I wanted to make the viola a kind of melancholy dreamer in the manner of Byron's child Harold. The result was a piece of music which Paganini would not play. For when Berlioz first showed him the outline of the first movement, he said there were far too many roasts in it. He was not prepared to play a piece of music where he stood silent for so long. Berlioz takes enormous interest in every kind of instrument, but he's not an instrument snob when it comes to string instruments. He doesn't pour praise on Stradivari violins or Guarneri violins. So, that he calls Henry Hill's Baroque Norman tenor an incomparable instrument is quite inconsistent with his experience of the instruments played by Paganini, by, uh, by Henry Hill's contemporaries, Vieton and Sainton. And it relates to something rather more special, rather more technological. It actually parallels the kind of vocabulary that he uses in the 1840s when describing the excitement and the possibilities that surround the invention of the saxophone. And in that sense, we see a real excitement in Berlioz's writing about the kind of viola which appeared in 1848 with Henry Hill as the soloist for the London premiere. The instrument in turn references all the way back to 1834, the last time that the English had seen Paganini on stage and to the premiere of the Sonata for Il Gran Viola. This is as close as possible to the instrument that Paganini was playing and it fulfills Paganini's ideas of what that large viola should be. In that sense, the instrument comes full circle. It is truly a Paganini-esque gesture. Lord Byron's Child Harold's Pilgrimage appeared in 11 English editions and 10 French editions between 1818 and 1835. The book became a sort of talisman which romantic intellectuals liked to carry and to be seen carry. Berlioz remembered sitting under the dome of St Peter's as a young man reading Byron's work. In his memoirs, he said that in 1831, he met a Venetian sailor who had traveled with Byron. I was much too pleased at meeting someone who had been with Child Harold on his pilgrimage, not to believe it all implicitly. Thank you. 
earlier as his Harold's in Italy, is his second symphony. Throughout the piece, the viola represents Harold's character, or perhaps represents Berlioz as he imagined himself as child Harold. After the first performance, which took place on the 23rd of November 1834, with the Orchestra de la Société de Concert du Conservatoire, a Parisian newspaper satirized the first entry of the viola as sounding like ha, ha, Harold, Harold, Harold. The soloist in that first performance was Chrétien Erhan. And four years later, on the 16th of December 1838, he, conducted again by Berlioz, gave another performance in Paris. And this time, Niccolo Paganini was in the audience. He was so overwhelmed by the piece that, following the performance, he dragged Berlioz onto the stage, and there he knelt and kissed his hand before a wildly cheering audience and the applauding musicians. A few days later, Paganini sent Berlioz a letter of congratulation in which he compared Berlioz to Beethoven and enclosed a bank draft for 20,000 francs. Berlioz would use this money to fund the composition of his Romeo and Juliet, the last piece which he dedicated to Paganini. <laughs> 